And we are live. Hello, everybody. Hello. There. We're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Tonight's guests, Craig Lawrence Gidney and Livia Llewellyn. So it is about five minutes to 7 p.m. Eastern time. We'll probably start the readings about 10 after 7 or so. But uh, Make yourself you comfortable. Have make a yourself drink. comfortable. Have a drink. Uh, there's plenty of seats. In <laughs> 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 An infinite number of seats. I never thought I'd miss the lack of seating in KGB, but now that I'm, we're not allowed to go there, <laughs> I desperately want to be in that room. <laughs> I know. I miss like the grimy floors and the mm -hmm. and the smell I miss of beer. And like, and on the Dan. I miss our bartenders. Yeah, Dan and Sagey. Yeah. I wonder what they're up to. I got an email from Dan at the beginning of this. Oh yeah, what do you say? He was just like, you know how he is. He's like, yeah, man, you're doing the right thing. I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it was great though. It was, it was Dan. He's he's awesome. Right. I, yeah, I adore him. He's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope I hope they're doing all right. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Oh, here comes Jack the Jerk. Hi, Jack. Uh, <laughs> just, in, just in time for me to uh, introduce him. Jack, what are you going to do? Jack the jerk. <laughs> Jack, what are you doing? You want more food, don't you? He's got his own banner. <laughs> Is he a black cat? I can just see his tail. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah, kind Jack. of blends in. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to. He's like, I love you. I hate you. Here I love he is. you. Oh, here he is. Oh, wow. He's beautiful, actually. Hey, Jack. Hey, he's very very beautiful. Beautiful. Remember me? I love you. <laughs> it looks pissed. Actually, um, last time I was there, he showed himself to me. Like, he was really timid the first couple of times. And then last time I was there, he came up to me and he let me pet him and everything. Come here, Jack. Jack. Yeah, the first, the first time, I think he was a little cautious. And then something just kind of snapped. And he just, like, would not stop rubbing up against me. Mm -hmm. And I had to... But then I had to pay all the really good. And then he got kind of mad because I wasn't paying enough attention. Mm -hmm. And then things got ugly. Did <laughs> <laughs> he try biting you? Did you try petting him when his tail was wagging? Once his tail wags, you'd stop petting. Yeah. And that, that's when you know he's going to. He tricked me. He didn't. I didn't see the tail. I don't think it was wagging. And. <laughs> It was a trap. I got cocky. A trap <laughs> yeah. notice because I forget sometimes and I'm petting him and suddenly I get this grab and bite. It's like, oh, fuck. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Melinda. Happy. Here's Jack. Happy, yeah. see, you can't see his head. It's in the up. Uh, but you can see his tail. Come here, Jack. Jack, you want to sit on my lap for a minute? Come here. Oh, Should Melinda you... says hello. Is, is it is it World Afro Day? She says happy World Afro Day. It, it is. is. Jack. I have to work on mine. I yeah. can't celebrate it, but I I love for everyone else who can celebrate it to celebrate yeah. it. <laughs> Come here, Jack. Yeah. I mean, back in the early days of the uh, pandemic, I was growing one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Cause what are they pictures? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I look like Boom Boom Freddie Washington. <laughs> no, not exactly. Yeah, oh, no. Boom Boom Freddie Washington. <laughs> so perfect. Oh, <laughs> from the uh, Sweat Hogs. He was one of the Sweat Hogs from Welcome Back, Potter. Huge back tail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on over here. Come on. Don't say, don't say his name. You're dating yourself. You got to come up with a, like a later name. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Please don't do that. No, don't do that. Hey, 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 hey. Well, if you're just joining us, hello. We have uh, <coughs> about 15 live viewers at the moment. We're still, we're just about seven o'clock. So we're wait for, waiting for more people to pop in. It's Jack. Okay, here he is. Come on, Jackie. Jack. Jack's next to me. Come here. Come here. No. So who else is who's reading in the next couple of months? We will announce that. Okay. We'll announce it. I, I, I can do it again, but um, not to write the to print it out. 
<laughs> I have it here. Uh, Joe have- Hill and Laird Barron next month. Yeah, and then Cat oh, Ram wow. and William Gibson in November 18th. Mm-hmm. Justin Key and Priya Sharma, December 16th. And that's it. We have Jeff Ford for March 17th. And that's where we are right now. Yeah. We're, mm-hmm. um, we, we have haven't done anything past January because we weren't sure what was going on. With, but, but we uh, want to get people who don't usually read the world. People around the world now. <laughs> You know, it's really cool to do that. Hi, Lizanne and Amy. Oh, someone uh, someone named Christopher liked your hair, liked your outfit. Oh, yeah, he lives in D.C. So. Hi, Gay. <laughs> <laughs> Jack. Jack, my handsome boy. My monster. <laughs> I cannot get Sophie to eat. I mean, I've been getting her cheap food. I've been getting her all kinds of different food. And she just wants the hard food. I mean, I gave her all this stuff with gravy. She eats the gravy and she won't eat the lumps in it. I don't know what to do with her. You know? It's like, what? She hates pate. She will never eat the pate. So I can't. Uh, you know. I know. She's very choosy. Hi, Steve. Steve Berman's here. She's a very choosy. Oh, wow. <laughs> Well, Steve, everything. Well, we both had books from Steve. Oh, yeah. You know, do you guys know of the hacker Kevin Mitnick? He was a famous hacker in like the eighties and nineties. Yeah, I just- when I when I was at Wiley, he published a book with with us. I don't remember the name, but yeah, no, I know, I know, I know who he is. So, well, I just read a. Um, it was like a. I guess it was biography kind of of him and um there, there's photographs of him and then i was like you know he really looks like steve berman <laughs> really <laughs> <is the moment. laughs> so, i mean when, when mitnick was younger i mean i think he's in his early 60s now but um yeah no the the younger the young pictures of him, i'm like that looks, looks like steve berman Livio, so. were you shocked that Steve was here? He said, you act shocked that I would attend. <laughs> I, I know Steve I'm, was like Googling. I'm like, just like shocked that. that everyone is still out there and still alive because I feel so isolated all the time now. <laughs> so is the outside world real? Is, is it all just another virtual simulation? I'm right back. I'm going to get a cough drop. Yeah, when I, uh, I've gotten to the point where I actually went to a restaurant and it was wow. outdoor seating, and I yeah. felt really yeah. weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been twice. Like the whole pandemic, I think we ate out twice, and it was it was both refreshing and kind of nerve wracking. Yeah, it. yeah. It was our anniversary, so we're like, we have to go out. <laughs> it's worth risking our lives for. But I'm afraid that I've become a recluse. <laughs> like at the end of it, I'm never going out or something. I know. I was kind of a recluse before, and now this is just like this is just like enforcing all of those reclusive <laughs> habits. And I'm worried that if the world goes back to normal, that I'm just gonna like never leave my apartment again anyway. <laughs> I've been, I've been eating at restaurants outside a lot, and I love it. It's wonderful. I mean, it really is lovely. And yes, I feel a little paranoid and worry a little bit, but you know, not that much. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jack was shaking Sophie, and there are CDs on my floor, and um, so someone was knocking them over. Jack was <laughs> probably Sophie, and just trying to get away from Jack, and they're both looking at each other. She's on, the, she's on my table looking at him. He's looking at her like he's going to jump, which means there'll be a very clatter of things on, from my desk. No, please don't. Yeah. <laughs> <As I> say, <laughs> no. So get off there so he doesn't place you on there. Okay. You're gonna you may hear a scream. If you hear a scream Well, Craig, you and I are totally gonna be upstaged by the cats. I think we just need right. to accept that right now and just be like no matter what we're reading, there's gonna be like crashes and screaming throughout. <laughs> well Jeff yeah. That's all right. we'll mute them, we'll mute the cat. <laughs> yeah. Chase Sophie into the back room. Uh, if, you're just, if you're just tuning in, this is uh, Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Uh, tonight's guests are Olivia Llewellyn and Craig Lawrence Gidney. Um, stick around after the readings. We're going to do a Q&A with the authors. So hopefully you have some uh, good questions for us. And bring your, yeah, bring your own questions. Yeah, you can put them in the live chat. 
-hmm. and we will we will oh, not now, but we won't be here. Yeah, no, not yet. So yes, it's lovely to see everybody. Yeah. But yes, I have been going. I'm going out to eat this Sunday. I think I went last week. Last weekend I went um, with a friend to Tea and Sympathy, and mm -hmm. we ran into oh. Chandler, we ran into Chandler and Eric and um, Amy Goldschlager. Oh, they okay. Were before us, I mean, it was really weird. They were eating together as well. <laughs> they were eating together. Okay. And then, I mean, they were meeting because they're uptown in Brooklyn, so they met mm -hmm. halfway. I mean, I live right there. Yeah. So next time we're actually going to try to make a date in October to for all of us to get together. Except I don't. You can't. When you're eating, you cannot socially distance from your eating partners. But you can right. never. We've been going up to the roof. Um, uh, our neighbors and our landlord. We just had like this kind of socially distanced, like Sunday night drinks. It was really nice actually. And then we have a view of the of Manhattan skyline. Right. Oh, that's nice. Behind me. Well, it's getting dark. The fire is not very nice. That's my lamp in the window. <clears throat> if I turn it off. Yeah, it's too dark. <laughs> you look a little ghostly. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, sorry. I just got an email. Oh, let me turn my email off so we don't hear <laughs> You don't want to hear my email, believe me. Okay, I turned off my email. Let me turn off my calendar so I. Hopefully won't hear that beeping either. There should be no extra sounds coming off from my computer anyway. We shall see. All right. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, I guess we'll get started. It's about eight after. Yeah, eight after. Uh, sure, we can start. Yeah. So, um, you're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Uh, Fantastic Fiction is a monthly reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month. It's been going strong since early uh, aughts, possibly even late 90s. We're not quite sure. Uh, the series itself was started by um, Terry Bisson and Alice K. Turner. Um, they started the reading series, uh, we think, in the late 90s, attempting to bring together mainstream writers of speculative fiction uh, excuse me, mainstream writers with writers of speculative fiction in order to show in Alice Turner's words that at a certain level they were plowing exactly the same field. In the spring of 2000, Ellen Datlow took over for Alice Turner. And in August 2002, Gavin J. Grant, publisher of Small Lear Press, stepped in for Terry Bisson when he moved to California. And author Matthew Kressel, that's me, stepped in for Gavin in 2008. Uh, we have a mailing list. Uh, let me see if I can bring it up here. Fantasticfiction.org, KGBFantasticfiction.org. There we go. Yeah. And uh, we send out just a couple emails each month just to remind you of the readings. Um, so, yeah, um, obviously we're not at the KGB bar. So, the KGB bar is this uh, Soviet themed uh, <coughs> bar in, in the um, East Village of Manhattan uh, that served as a kind of uh, speakeasy for Ukrainian socialists in the McCarthy period. Um, they have a, um, club upstairs and a, and a theater downstairs and it's, it's had several incarnations, but, um, since the pandemic, we've been doing it online. This is actually our seventh month doing it, which is kind of cool because I feel like we just started. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like when, when everything started to hit the fan in, in March, Ellen and I were like, you know, we, we really can't do this in person. It's just not safe. So. Uh, and then everything closed down. We had no choice. Right. Um, so I said, why don't we do it online? And it's it's actually been really successful. Um, we've gotten a lot of views, a lot of good feedback. Um, you know, like we do a, um, a reading on YouTube and, um, you know, we get a fair amount of views, but then it's on YouTube, right? So then I look back a week, to, you know, two weeks, a couple months later, and it's like it's it's hundreds of views, thousands. So it's it's pretty cool that that people are all over the world are able to watch. We've had people, I think, from Australia, from Switzerland, Israel, like all over the world, uh, are able to watch this. It's really cool. Uh, so thank you for tuning in. Um, so the KGB bar, um, yeah. So they're they're shut down as as is a lot of as are a lot of places. Um, you can support the KGB bar uh, by going to that URL on the screen there. Um, and just donating. So um, the bar was 
uh, listed by the New York Times as being one of the best literary venues in New York City. And it's been closed for seven months. And we really, really hope that they stay open. So yeah. not only are reading series fantastic fiction, but they have um, a reading or a poetry <laughs> reading or, or other events almost every night of the week, or they did. And, you know, we really, we really hope that they stay open because, you know, the, the city, you know, we want to keep arts and culture going strong. So if you can donate, uh, go to that URL, you know, maybe if you went to the bar, you'd buy a drink, give them, give them a few bucks, uh, the cost of a drink or two, and uh, they really appreciate it. And then the owner, Dennis Wojcik, um, promises to give a percentage of the donations to the bartenders. Uh, hello, Dan. Hello, Sagey, our favorite bartenders at the bar there. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we introduce our readers, uh, just talk about um, coming up. Don't do that. Uh, next month, October 21st, we have Joe Hill and Laird Barron joining us. Uh, November 18th, William Gibson and Kat Rambo. December 16th, we have Priya Sharma and Justin Key. Um, we haven't um, scheduled too many readers for uh, 2021 yet because we were waiting to see uh, what happens. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so right now it's kind of up in the air. Um, like I said before, we're going to have a Q&A with the authors. So um, think of some good questions or maybe as they're reading, you can uh, come up with some questions that you'd like to ask them and then just put them in the live chat and uh, we'll ask them uh, those questions after the readings. So um, our first reader tonight is going to be Craig Lawrence Gidney. Uh, Craig Lawrence Gidney is the author of the collections See, Swallow Me, and Skin Deep Magic, the novels Bereft and A Spectral Hue and numerous short stories. Both his collections and A Spectral Hue were final finalists for the Lambda Literary Award, and Bereft won the Bronze, Moonbeam, and Silver IPPY Awards. Hair's Breath, a fairy tale novel, is currently serialized on Broken Eye Books. Craig is a lifelong resident of Washington, D.C. Here's Craig. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to read from my novel, A Spectral Hue. Um, what you need to know about the book is that it is a ghost story, an intergenerational ghost story, and it's it centers around sort of uh, outsider artists. So it's set in a small fictional town in the eastern shore of Maryland. And I am going to be reading from chapter five. And this is from the viewpoint of the ghost herself. And chapter five is called Fuchsia. At first, she saw the girl in flashes. She was a scrawny thing more like a bundle of sticks than a little girl. She practically swam in her homespun dress. Her features were sharp and bird-like. Her eyes took in everything and found it lacking. At first, she really didn't like the girl. She was a wild thing, tart-tongued and crafty. Her name, though, was pretty enough. Hazel was a beautiful color a lovely shade of golden brown, not unlike the girl's skin tone. And after a while, she began to like Hazel. She loved the way the child moved, quick and determined, and how she was stubborn and high-spirited. She was like a sudden gust of wind given form. She had still had no name and no memory. Was she dead? A haint, haunting a place where she lived? Was she an angel sent to watch over the child? Or was she something else? She decided to put the matter aside of her exact spiritual designation for the time being. She needed a name, a word to place her in time, in space, in context. The gown that she wore that lurid purple-pink mist-like fabric that draped her formless form must be a clue. The word floated up like a bubble, 
the name of the collar she wore, which she now took as her own name. It was as beautiful and strange as the color it described, fuchsia. Her name, for it now at least, would be fuchsia. Fuchsia found herself living, leaving the beautiful marsh just to watch the child in motion. It didn't bother her that Hazel couldn't see her. Sometimes she would visit the child every day. Other times, time would have elapsed and Hazel had grown a bit. Fuchsia dimly recognized the house Hazel inhabited. The house was three stories made of brick and the entrance was ornate with a slate porch and pillars. The front grounds were hemmed in by a copse of oak, sumac, and sycamore trees. The lawn was well manicured and a circular garden full of pansies and peonies grew in the shade of a chinaberry tree. Hazel lived with other servants in a small stone house at the back of the house, which faced the marsh. When Hazel entered the house, Fuchsia stayed outside or returned to the beautiful wetlands with their crystal water and submerged spears of emerald grass. It was as if the house repelled her. Perhaps there was some kind of ward against whatever she was. She could observe Hazel in the slave quarters she shared with the other four servants. She could go into the stable where Hazel rarely went. She was afraid of horses. Fuchsia could even go into the root cellar beneath the house, but the house itself wouldn't let her inside. She would, could walk around the ivy colored house. Fuchsia could explore the roof, its cracked ceiling tiles where the pigeons nested, but the house itself was impenetrable. When she tried, she would find herself in the marsh or in a tree or in the circular garden beneath the chinaberry tree. Furthermore, time had passed, sometimes an hour, sometimes a week, before she could return. Maybe she wasn't an angel after all. Maybe she was something to be feared. She came to recognize the faces of the other people who stepped into the house the bony-faced lady of the house, the gray-haired patriarch with wild eyebrows. There were two boys, young men really, the tall, studious, red-haired one, the squat, lurching, rough-and-tumble, brown-haired one. Both of them were sprinkled with freckles. When they spoke, Fuchsia could understand them, but she immediately forgot what they said. It wasn't important. Their talk was like the cooing of doves, the cawing of ravens, the cheering of crickets. All of them loved Hazel, even when they chastised her, and Hazel loved them too. But she seemed to love the land, the shimmering expanse of water and islets, just a tad more. One night, Fuchsia visited Hazel, the girl, now 14, was ill. An illness, one that made breathing difficult, had touched the house and the entire eastern shore. The boisterous boy had had it for a while. She remembered him sitting on the porch, wrapped in a blanket, watching the slaves work. One day, Fuchsia saw Hazel tremble, then fall like a leaf when she was doing the laundry outside. She waited patiently by the girl's feverish body, listening to the rasp of her breath. Breath. If only she could touch the child or summon help. But Fuchsia was nothing. She was invisible, a will of the wisp dreamed up by the land, if even that. So she waited beside her only friend who did not know that she existed. She sang to her even though she did not have a voice. She stroked Hazel's sweat-sheened forehead with the drapery of her sleeve. The girl's eyes 
opened a little in a squint. They quivered, leaking water. Hazel said softly, I like that dress. It sure is a pretty color. Then her eyes closed again. Judith found Hazel shortly thereafter. She called for Jethro and Caleb to help carry the girl to her bed. Hazel was in a delirium, muttering nonsense about angels in bright purple robes. She was the color of the marsh bells, she told Judith, who lay her on her straw bed. Hush, child. You was just seeing things, Judith said. I remember when the missus got the fever and she was talking to her dead mother. But I saw her, Hazel insisted, and she was colored too, real dark skinned. Jethro, get the brandy and have the missus get Dr. Walters. Hazel's in a bad way. Fuchsia watched this exchange chat silently. She saw me, she thought. She burned with excitement. Furthermore, she was in the house. Maybe there was a way to communicate with her. She had been alone for too long. Herons and ospreys were beautiful, but she couldn't speak to them. Then Judith's words, Hazel is in a bad way, took on a sinister meaning. Maybe the girl, barely a teenager, was close to death. Fuchsia's aching loneliness wouldn't be cured by Hazel's sudden death. She may not have been an angel, but she didn't wish any harm to come to the girl. She watched and waited as Judith wiped down Hazel's face with cool rags. When Caleb came with the brandy, which he gave to the girl to help her sleep, Fuchsia had no sense of time. Minutes or hours might have passed. She never got tired and had no need of sleep. She could have gone back to the wetlands and the beauty that she loved. Instead, she stood vigil over the girl. Hazel tossed and turned. Her breathing was rapid. Finally, Dr. Walters arrived. He was a sickly looking thing himself bald as a turtle and covered in liver spots. His eyes were pale blue and rimmed in red. He took one look at Hazel and declared her a consumptive. He didn't even bother to open his medical bag. Is there anything you can do to lessen her pain? Caleb asked. He spoke proper English when he had to. She needs to go to a sanatorium, the doctor replied, but they don't have sanatoriums for niggers. I can give her medication for her pain, but she needs a diet of bone broth, plenty of liquids and sleep. When the doctor left, Judith conferred with Caleb. I don't think she's long for this world. Why do you say that? She said she saw an angel a colored angel. Caleb said, you remember how the missus saw her dead mother when she was sick? I imagine that this is the same thing. That colored angel was probably her mother as she remembered her. Fuchsia heard this. Maybe I am the girl's mother. It was a plausible reason for her connection to the girl, but somehow it seemed wrong. She was also joined to the unspoiled land where she lived, the sanctuary where the purple pink marsh flowers grew. She loved that place the same way she loved Hazel. There was something of the marsh in that girl. Fuchsia couldn't quite piece it together. This, however, was a mystery to ponder. It was a puzzle, not important. She could figure out the mystery later when the girl was out of harm's way. Fuchsia stayed by the girl's bedside for a long time. She was there when the girl was given medicine and broth by the well-meaning but distant Judith. She watched as Jethro and Caleb prayed over her. 
Even the misses visited the girl with a nosegay of lavender pressed to her face. She was also vigilant over the child when no one was around. She tried touching the sleeping girl, but her hand vanished like smoke upon contact. Smoke. Smoke was vaporous, was like breath, vaporous and curling. It was more like an instinct than an actual idea. Fuchsia bent down and gently kissed Fuchsia, Hazel's lips. They were as soft as petals. And I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. That's fabulous. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's great. So um, we're gonna take like a really short break. Uh, let everyone fill up their drinks, uh, go to the restroom if they need to, and then we will be back in five minutes with Livia Llewellyn. So stick around. We'll be right back. I'm going to drink a, oh, cool. a glass of vodka. I have my right. vodka. I'm going to get some vodka and grass. Bye. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're just waiting for Ellen to come back. Oh, now you guys here. Yeah, awesome. What do you? What do you? Do? All right, I have a glass. Excuse me. Jack's sitting next to me. He won't. He's in the way. Here's my glass. Oh, Jack. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Huh. Oh, it's Linda. Hi, Linda. And Teresa. Oh, all these people. Cool. Well, our next reader tonight is the great Livia Llewellyn, who is a writer of dark fantasy <laughs> and erotica, whose short fiction has appeared in over 80, 80 anthologies and magazines. Her collections, Engines of Desire and Furnace, have both received Shirley Jackson Award nominations for Best Collection. And her short story, One of These Nights, won the Edgar Award for Best Short Story. She lives in Jersey City. Please welcome Livia. Uh, I like how the end is like, ah, she lives in Jersey City, so, you know, <laughs> kind of cancels everything else out. Um, so tonight I'm going to be reading from a novella that I'm in the middle of writing. 
And this is the beginning section. And I know that some of you may be here for the disgusting descriptions of body horror and completely inappropriate sexual uh, positions and situations. And I'm sad to say that none of that is going to happen in this first section. Um, all of that does happen in the novella, but it will happen at the end. And you will have to buy the novella because it's it's for charity. It's um, it's for Nightscape Press for their charitable chapbook collection. And the novella is called Glorious. And um, when it's ready, you know, for sale, um, part of the proceeds will go to first books. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read the, the naughty bits. You have to pay for those. Um, so <laughs> I'm not going to, all right, I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, I'm just going to start reading. Glorious. In the beginning, before our glorious summer Aegon began, there was gray-green spring and our parents, eight ordinary residents of a placid, untroubled corner of this flat, endless sub existence we call suburbia. Unknown to each other, barely known to themselves or to us, they decided to enroll us in a summer school class held at a local high school, local in the sense that it was only 20 or so blocks walking distance at the most from our individual apartments and houses. Each of us seemingly apart and independent at the time, yet already casting out the sticky invisible webbings that would bind us into a singular entity, picked the same class, beginning art for quiet and reflective young girls of suburbia. Watercolors and oils, pencil sketches, sculpture, found art, and the fostering and appreciation of skills we would in all likelihood never again after this summer in this life have any use for. Yet, the thought of capturing something we could not tangibly see or hold in our hands and imprisoning it on canvas or in plaster, ours to admire and to own, spoke deeply to each of us. And so our parents enrolled us in art class for the summer of our 15th year to start a week after we finish our final year in the separate junior high schools we attended. Long before we came together, our fates had bound us together as one. And so on a quiet Monday morning in July, the first and oldest of us by four months, as she loved to remind us, Julia the Elder, as we grew to call her, rose from her bed, quickly and quietly dressed in the gloomy morning light, and slipped out of the front door of the apartment she shared with her parents, a younger sister and an older brother. Julia lived the furthest from the high school in a block of brownish, fake Tudor apartments behind a small, seedy business intersection comprised of an insurance company, a discount furniture store, two bars, a diner with an attached grocery market, and four other aging storefronts that gave no indication as to what services they offered behind their blank, dusty windows. An intersection as was typically found every 10 or so blocks between the rows of one and two story houses that spread in all directions to a horizon we would never reach the end of. Julia stopped briefly at her intersection diner for a cup of milky sweet coffee and a stale muffin or Danish left over from the day before and destined for the trash, deeply discounted of course. We were none of us poor, but all frugal in our various ways. More to the point, hot coffee and sticky dry pastries were the rituals of the adults we wanted to become. It was our opening a door and dipping our toes into the darker and more mysterious world beyond, a world whose vocabulary and geography we were hesitant and anxious to learn. As the June days turned into weeks and we came to know each other and think and speak and move as one under the flickering fluorescent lights and peeling walls of the art room, that single cup of coffee would grow to four, and the single pastry to a paper bag of various leftovers crowned with a layer of thin napkins and flimsy forks, which we would all partake of from after our contributions to this new jersey, new new journey. N Man, I really screwed the brooch there. Which we would p all partake from after our contributions to this new journey. Cigarettes from Melissa. Rum from Vivica, 
pornography from Alicia made their way from secret cupboards and cabinets in our parents' houses into Julia's paint-stained school bag. Melissa was usually the next to rise, throwing back the covers and stretching her bit into the quick nails toward the dusty ceiling of her poster-covered bedroom. Melissa the wilderness, we called her for the dark coils of hair she wore up until the bell sounded at the end of the class, at which time she would let them loose with a flick of her fingers to cascade over her shoulders like the thick black branches of a wind-tossed evergreen. By the time she was dressed and out the door, a piece of toast in her mouth every day that first week, Julia would be somewhere in the vicinity, a layer of skin forming on top of her cooling coffee as she quickly walked down the cracked, grass-lined slabs of sidewalk in the chilly air. We, too, were the first to see each other on the empty morning streets and walk into the musty building together, the first to smile at each other across the room as the teacher slid the wooden pointer across centuries-old examples of thoroughbreds, castles, bowls of fly-blown fruit, and imperious women standing in half-empty rooms, the fabrics of their dresses billowing about them like pyroclastic flow. By the end of the first week of summer school, Julia the Elder was already carrying a second cup of coffee and slowing her steps as she approached the little one-story rambler that Melissa, Melissa mounded from every morning. No more toast between her teeth like a thieving dog, but a pack of stolen cigarettes and book of matches in her hand. At school, we sat together. Julia with her oils and Melissa with her graphite pencils, diligently working on seen from outside my bedroom window assignment as we spoke in hushed tones about high school, freedom, life, all the things we wanted in a future we could not yet reach. Across the art room, Vivica the wary knew she had to become one of us, that she already was one of us. It was more than a longing. It was a profound molecular level conviction that we had always meant to be together. The to walk in unison down the lonely black top streets of our house and yard lined universe, smelling of tobacco and coffee and perfume, clinging to each other for strength as the vapid monotony of our existence rolled over and through us, leaving us unscathed, uncrushed, free. We would not be like our parents. There had to be something else out there, beyond the horizon, beyond the shingled rooftops and lonely crust clusters of evergreens. At the end of the second week of class, the vicar walked the 14 blocks in the opposite direction of Melissa's and Julia's homes to her parents' modest two-story house that sat on a slight rise in the land, a true and rare anomaly in this part of the world. Vivica's bedroom was on the second floor, and she spent the weekend with her father's old telescope, peering at the flat roof of the high school, the tiny houses and toilet cars, the curls of smoke rising from intersections. She watched the days falter, stumble, and bruise into purple nights, studded with street lamps and porch lights and the occasional deep streak of neon writing. Meanwhile, many streets in rows and cul-de-sacs away, Melissa and Julia spoke to each other on kitchen phones, our voices traveling back and forth through the wires and cables, bristling from the heads of telephone poles in thick black ropes while our families slept, oblivious to our late night longings and murmurations. The next Monday, the third Monday of our summer of art, Vivica rose before the rest of us, fierce determination flooding her strong, slender limbs as she wrapped herself in summer layers and snuck out the front door long before the break of dawn, a small water bottle filled with purloined rum tucked deep in her backpack. Thin mist rolled across the lawn, leaving behind droplets of dew on the web strung between the long blades. Not even the dogs of night were awake to bark at the scent of her body and breath slipping down the empty roads, her shadow dancing as she passed under swaying traffic lights. By the time it's the sky had begun to cast off its mantle, Vivica had reached the high school and situated herself by the front door. When Melissa and Julia arrived an hour later, she held up the bottle, and we all smiled at each other as if we had known each other for centuries. And so the three of us sat together and the two cups of coffee became three, laced with rum and flecked with crumbs of food destined for the vast midden fields of the Northern continent. Small feasts we alone had the foresight to save from ignoble extinction. 
Pale watercolors flecked our hands and wrists as we diligently recreated tables of vegetables and flowers in the center of the room. And we added flies to the corners of our canvases for verisimilitude to show that we were the masters of all we captured with our brushes and paint. June had burned away into July and the last of the spring chill went with it. Summer bled out all across our cedar gabled land in the form of cruising low riders, distant stereo drones, unruly lawns, and the buzz everywhere the relentless buzz of lawn mowers under hard blue skies. Everyone grew lethargic and restless. Our parents drank themselves into surly exhaustion, and the hot air smelled like dank classroom sweat and oily paint, no matter where we were. And just as June became July, so did the third week of class became the fourth, and we plunged our hands into soft sculpting clay, caressing and pinching and forcing the supple material into lopsided torsos and eyely spaces open-mouthed and gasping for release from our clumsy touch. It was then that Alicia spun into our orbit without introduction or preamble, as if she had been in step with us since our beginning. Alicia, who had been watching us for the past three weeks as closely as we'd been watching her. Alicia, who always turned every assignment into an opportunity to sneak breasts and penises into her landscapes and still lives and architectural studies to our endless delight. Alicia, the revelator. Alicia, who had only lived two blocks away from the high school her entire life, and who had snuck into the classroom during the night and sculpted not one, but multitudes of objects so disgusting and anatomically explicit that our teacher shrieked and ordered the entire class out of the room the second Alicia whipped the drop cloths away from her lovingly created profanities. We ran down the halls and burst from the double doors into bright sun, laughing and shrieking, blinking in stunned joy. For the first time this summer, we were free to do as we pleased for the entire day. The rest of the class scattered in all directions before our teacher changed her mind, all of them chattering excitedly as they returned to their small houses, their small apartments, their small rooms. That could be us. Well, it wouldn't be. Not today. Alicia held up her hands and rubbed her fingertips together. Small grains of dried plaster sloughed off her skin and floated onto her skirt, her shoes, the concrete steps. Just like that, all was quiet again. Our classmates had melted into the landscape and just the four of us remained together and alone as we secretly knew it would always be. Julia touched Alicia's arm and murmured, took your time joining us. And Alicia said, I know, and we smiled as we agreed. We were one now, we were complete. We couldn't stay here though and risk being dragged back inside, but we couldn't go home. Now, we had to do something while we had the chance. We confirmed with each other. Melissa walked down the steps to the edge of the sidewalk and turned in a slow circle. We followed suit. All we could see was the high brick walls of the school. And as we turned the corner, the blacktop recess area with its torture garden of basketball hoops and middle pole forest of exercise equipment. And all the small houses across the street and beyond, rows and rows of silent single-story colleges and ramblers with neat lawns and curtained windows and one or two fastidiously pruned bushes at the edge of each narrow driveway and white-doored garage. We could be anywhere in the world. It was like this everywhere in the world. Except for the occasional intersection in school, this was all there was of the world. There had to be more than this, we decided. There had to be some place new we could go, some place interesting to kill time and be left alone until the afternoon when we would have no choice but to go home. Julia suggested a diner, always a diner with her. She loved being enclosed in small dark public spaces, her coffee and smokes and books spread out on the table before her. We made little murmurs of dissent in response. It wasn't the right time of day, it wasn't the right vibe. She agreed, and we drifted down the sidewalk that hugged one long wing of the school. The large windows were dark, but we caught glimpses of bookcases, posters, chalkboards, stacks of desks and chairs. Hard to believe we would be there in those classrooms in just a few months, not as childish interlopers scribbling pretty colors on paper, but as high school students learning. What would we learn? What did anyone learn in these places that we didn't already know? Was it the knowledge we needed to escape suburbia or was it knowledge that would trap us here forever? We discussed this in earnest until we reached the end of the block. 
From this corner, we saw through the chain link fence surrounding the outdoor gym into a smaller tree-lined courtyard at the back of the school with vending machines and stacks of gardening equipment and mysterious boxy machines pushed up against one wall. Several large janitor carts were lined up along the other side of the courtyard. Between them, a set of doors opened into a darkened space. Alicia. She smiled and motioned to us as she picked up the pace and we followed our steps quickening into a light jog as we realized she had been leading us to this spot, to this way back into the school. One by one, we pushed our way through a long tear in the chain links that Alicia parted then bent back after we birthed our way in. We followed her in silence past the tables and carts and machines into the black of the building only slowing as we blinked the blinding after explosions of light away in the darkened space. Through the room into a corridor crammed with supplies. Down a hallway and through a room the size of a closet to stairs, leading down into a basement with clanking pipes lining the ceilings, over to a small metal door that opened after Alicia slid a key taken from her leather satchel into the brass knob. Up the narrow flight of stairs and out onto a white rooftop that dazzled and blinded us. One by one, we left the darkness, Alicia first and holding Melissa's hand, who held Julia's, who held Vivica's, and we snaked out into the light and heat, letting the fireworks in our eyes fade in degrees as we made our winding way to the edge of the roof. There we leaned against the waist-high wall and looked out at all the little places where we lived. None of us had ever been this high in the world before, even Vivica in her second story bedroom. Suburbia spread out before us entirely new, shockingly wide and intricate and infinite, a carpet whose threads encircled the entire earth. One by one, we sought out and found little bits of familiar corners, our little intersections in elementary schools and homes, our known roads and byways and those small undeveloped lots that stood in as temporary parks and picnic areas for the surrounding neighborhood until construction workers swarmed out of nowhere like bees and rapidly built new houses to replace the missing, the dilapidated, the old. We did not realize how large the world was until now as our excitement slowly burned away, or how small we were, or how everything looked the same, Julia pointed out, how there was virtually no difference in any of our non-named neighborhoods. A carpet with no pattern, no color in the threads. We followed almost the entire edge of the roof, and for the sameness of each direction, it was as if we never moved. And then we reached Vivica's house. She'd been standing at that part of the roof for some time, mesmerized by the view. Come here, I need you to look at this, she told us, and our feet crunched across the gravelly surface. See my house, the yellow one just barely sticking up over there, just to the right of that neon sign, the pharmacy sign, you can barely see it. We each raised one of hand, tracing the outlines of rooftops with our fingers until we found her house. Can you see the school from here, Melissa asked. Yes, but I could only see in this direction. I never knew what was on the other side of the house until today. My parents' and grandmother's rooms are on that side. I don't go in them. Look, just look beyond the house. Do you see it? Further to the right, near the horizon. Do you see it? We don't know how long we stood there, hips pressed against the high brick ledge of the roof, hands shielding our eyes. We stood until the sun shifted position in the sky and it became clear what lay blocks and blocks beyond Vivica's house, what sprawled like the skeleton of a massive beast in a swaying mass of uncut trees. Forest, true forest, real forest, and the delicate brown scaffolding of what looked to be a building that when finished would be larger than any we had ever imagined could exist in the world. And in the center, in the clearing, in the center, something pale and motionless, small and yet smooth enough to catch the light and cast it off like a beacon. Something stood there. We stood, staring, until the sun started casting shadows across the land, a little lights began to twinkle in the fading afternoon lights that surrounded the forest but did not bleed into it. Only the distant howl of a car horn released us from our spell. 
and we made our way in the dying day back down through the school and outside, each of us heading home, each of us asking the same question to ourselves. What was that? And did it see us? But each of us secretly answering it in a completely different way. That's it. <laughs> so is that is that Lovecraftian? Are they tentacles? It is, it is 100 yeah. percent not Lovecraftian. It is not Lovecraftian okay. at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> That's what a pentacled nope. monster would say. It's not, it's not, <laughs> this is not going to be a Lovecraft novella. I I'm okay. I'm serious. Okay. This is this is more uh folklore de demonic, I would say. Okay. Okay. Fair. Not, not devil, devil, but more <laughs> just more more I think demonic is the word the best word. And don't worry, there will be lots of sex and penises and horrible stuff that you never, never wanted to ever read, and <laughs> there it was. So for those who right. are worried, good, they're good, like, good. that sounds really literary, you know. <laughs> don't worry. I will mess you up at the end. <laughs> uh, it's going to be around 22,000 words. I, and I don't think it'll come out this year. year. Um, I should have it finished by the end of the month. And um, then, you know, it's for Nightscape Press and they have, you know, a lot of big projects going on. So I imagine it will come out probably sometime the first half of next year. Cool. Okay. Um, Craig, what are you working on now? You're talking about Harris, Harris Breath. Um, is currently serialized. Is that your most recent uh, fiction work? Yes, I am working on, it's kind of a fairy tale retelling of Rapunzel. Mm -hmm. And that one, it actually, it's funny, you mentioned earlier today that it was World Afro Day. <laughs> it's about a girl with a magic afro. Okay. All right. <laughs> and it kind of deals with sort of the politics around black hair and colorism. Cool. Okay. Is it still, are you still writing it or is it finished? Because you said it's I'm still writing it. Oh, okay. Oh, so when do you expect that to be finished? Do you know? Uh, I ex I want it to be finished by, let's say, by the end of the winter. <laughs> okay. And um, once it's serialized, will Broken Eye Books be bringing it out as a book? Yes, they will be. Okay, cool. And I'm excited about that, too. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we're taking questions from the audience, guys. If you have any questions, please ask them. We'll be happy to um, show them to our authors here, our readers. I have a question for Craig. Okay. What's an outsider artist? Um, outsider artists are artists that, well, there are two versions of it. One of it is just anyone outside of sort of the art world who just starts making art and doesn't, um, doesn't go to school and gets formally trained. The second version, which is the one that I'm more interested in, is are people like uh, Henry Darger, um, people who they believe that their art is kind of like in conversation with some spiritual thing or something beyond the world. And um, I'm not the only one who writes about that. The Elizabeth Hand, who also uh, briefly lived in DC and I knew her then, actually wrote a novel called Curious Toys in which uh, Henry Darger was a uh, detective. Yeah. Um, have you been to the museum in Baltimore, the wonderful outside art museum? Yes, I have. And then the one in New York too. I love, there's one in New York, did you say? Yes, there is. And I it's free. In Baltimore a few times, it's amazing. But where's the one in New York? In New York City? I forget I mean, the exact museum. 
that's different. It's called folk art museum. Oh, okay, that's folk different. Art. I mean, I can. I mean, there may be some outsider art in that. Oh, there's plenty there's of them. Yeah. An outsider art museum. Yeah. I mean, I think. I guess folk art and outsider art could overlap. I guess. I mean, it depends. Um, it depends on how you define. Again, how you define what outsider art right. is. Right. A lot of it does have. Uh, there are a lot of outsider artists there mm -hmm. um, that are. Actually, it's big, in many ways its holdings are bigger than the ones in the, um, Baltimore. Really? So, I had yeah. been for a while. Where is it located now? I think it moved. I could not tell you exactly yeah, where it is. Near Lincoln Center, and then I think it might have moved to near um, the the um, in the Museum of Modern Art, but I'm not even sure. I you think know it, it was there, and then something happened with the rent. I mean. It's always like either the rent or someone took it over. I don't know what happened, but I but that that building disappeared, and I don't know if it was taken over by the Museum of Modern Art or not. But I I don't know where they moved to or if they are even open in any capacity somewhere else. It was a big, huge, like not a scandal, but it was it was like there was a big furor over over their closing down a couple yeah. of years ago. Carrie, are you talking about the um, the one at the Folk Art Museum in New York? She said she saw, yeah. saw a full exhibit of Masonic Fellowship Art at the Folk Art Museum, which was pretty outsidery. Uh, yeah. For a second to reply, but we, oh, go ahead, Craig. Sorry. Yeah, I think that was the one that I went to, and I went to it. I want to say after Spectral Hue was published, so it was still opened. Yeah. Sometime. Uh, when I went to it, I mean, initially, I mean, I worked at Omni near Lincoln Center, and it used to be right across the street, right next door to the um, uh, Ladder Saints thing, mm -hmm. which may still be there. Um, it used to be right next door to that, and then after that is when it moved to the to uh, off Fifth Avenue. So I don't know where it is now. I'll have to look it up, see if it's still around. Uh, we have a question from Amy Gretsch for Olivia. Olivia, what scares you? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy so much like i mean i don't know if you mean like real world, world scaring or um or like supernatural things that scare me in which case i would say going going with like 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 non-real world things that scare me um boy i, I would say um Does anything scare me? <laughs> That's like imaginary. I don't, you know, because I, I really actually, I don't think anything does. Like when I'm in the, okay, when I'm in the theater, when I'm watching movies, what scares me the most are probably um, things like possession, um, because I, I feel like having something done to your body is horrible, but having your body taken over is is worse mm -hmm. um like serial killers are bad but um but a, a demonic possession um mm -hmm. is means that you have to believe in something that that is like so vast and so big and so beyond your comprehension that it, it's not something you can control mm -hmm. so so i would say yes in terms of like like art and like movies and books that that disturbs me. It scares me. Um, in real life, it's just like things like rap. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, in real life, real life scares me much more than fiction does. Although there have been moments more in movies than in books that stick with me that really, you know, have an impact that I do not want to watch them again kind of thing. But it's not a scare. It's more that it, I don't know, it unnerves me, I guess, or it, yeah, actually, things things that really disturb me. There are certain movies um, that I I watch once, and they may not be like horror movies, but something happens to the protagonist, and um, like psychological things that just like are disturbing, you know, on a very deep and profound level. And so I won't watch those things again. Mm -hmm. um, Right. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, I'm not. I'm, I guess this is how you define scare versus 
upset, you know? I mean, it's scaring. Does it, if it scares you, does that mean it's going to, you're afraid it's going to happen to you? I mean, see. Not, not necessarily, right? Not for how you define scaring, I realize, you know. I mean, there, there's like the short scare, you know, but then there's the, the long, the long, profound scare where after you've turned off the movie or you've left the theater or you've closed the book, like a day later, you realize you're leaving all the lights on and you can't stop thinking about, you know, what's happened and, you know, Never things. Never happened to me. Never happened. <laughs> really? Except actually the Blair Witch Project, I was visiting a friend and afterwards I was staying on a second floor. Um, in a house, and at that for five seconds, I was a little freaked out. But it's like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and oh, and one time I was re re reading Salem's Lot in a big apartment in the Upper West Side, and the lights—it was getting dark. You know, as I'm reading, it's getting to be dusk and everything. And there must have been someone else in the apartment, but I didn't know. But I was like afraid of being left by myself. <laughs> <laughs> How do you not know there's someone else in the apartment? <laughs> I mean, it had to be yeah. visiting, so there must have been someone else in the apartment. You know, it wasn't my apartment. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Steve Berman for for both of you. Let's start with Craig. A college professor is using your books in a class. What is the subject of the class? Cool. Uh, I would say um, race and gender. <laughs> Something about race and gender in and. and uh, in contemporary fiction, <laughs> something like that. This is really funny because actually my brother who is a college professor emailed me the slides for his, his latest, the thing that he's teaching. And he said that he included me in it. And oh. it was about how children use fantasy to cope mm -hmm. with things. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, I actually had that experience. Wow. Livia, what about you? I would say probably my stories would be used as an example of weird fiction. Again, it would be, um, you know, gender, you know, like maybe, you know, how women approach horror and certain subjects as, as opposed to, you know, some, uh, you know, male horror writers, um, you know, or, it, they could also be used for um, classes, you know, dealing with, you know, Lovecraft and how his subject matter is being reclaimed by kind of a new generation of writers who are rejecting, you know, a lot of personal beliefs and and kind of, you know, re reimagining his his monsters and his his world building, you know, in ways that you know, he might not have approved of, but who knows? Um, he's dead, so it's our shit now. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a story for a uh, question for Craig. Uh, what story have you written that you are most proud of? Hmm. They were all my children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, love them equally. Um, I guess the one that, that all of a sudden that everyone seems to love is a circus boy without a safety net. And it's kind of like a fairy tale coming out story for black gay men and boys. So maybe that one, I'll say that circus boy without a safety net. Olivia, what about you? Um, I, I would say probably and love shall have no dominion. Mm -hmm. It's not a story that a lot of people have um, have commented on or reviewed. So I don't know, you know, what people, what readers seem to think of it. It's not as well known, I guess, as a lot of my stories. Um, I I just really love it. It's about a demon who possesses a woman, but then he becomes possessed by love mm -hmm. and, and it changes him and it changes their entire relationship and his relationship to the universe. And um, it's always made me a little sad that I haven't gotten a lot of, well, any critical feedback on it. It, when I, published it it was in this huge anthology called demon you know with a <laughs> cover 
or you know. I was going to ask both of you where where we could find these stories. Yeah, it's a, well, it's in Furnace, um, but it's also it was originally published in um, an anthology. Um, I, I, I sent it to John Skip, who was the editor, and he loved it. It was great. And I was like, oh, my God, the story is so great. It's going to get so much attention. I'm so excited. <laughs> and the anthology came out, and everyone was, all the reviewers were talking about Neil Gaiman's reprint and Stephen King's reprint and, and like, a couple of other big names. And I was like, how dare they talk about these people? Wasn't that the first thing you ever read at KGB? What? Wasn't that the first thing you ever read at KGB? Yes, it was, and it scared the crap out of me. Very sexy. <laughs> what, wait, what year was that? Do we have that on a podcast? I. It might have been after, before that. We did before we did those. But yeah, we started in 2015. So when did before. you read it first for us? So before that. Yeah. No, I see. Maybe. I, I don't remember if it was the first thing, but it was, it was, yeah, I, I wrote it, I read it and it was, it was the evening with N.K. Jemison. Um, I'll have to check, but I think we, we might have yeah. it on the podcast. Uh, that was, yeah. So, so anyway, I learned a very valuable and important lesson about publishing in anthologies. <laughs> <laughs> but but in the meantime, it's it's a great story. I love it. It's it's one of my favorites. It it has a special place in my heart. So, you know. and what there about you? Story, a, Where wait, can we it was an earlier question. If we can find it, hang on. Well, while we look for it, Craig, tell us where we can find your the story. Okay. Um, both in my uh, in my my book, Sea Swallow Me. Okay, and it was also podcasted by Glittership, so oh. you can actually listen to someone read it. Awesome. Um, Matt, you see from Dave Ring, general question: What's the big story idea you're still grappling with, trying to figure out if you're ready to write it? Ah, okay, that was way back there. There we go. Seven fifty-eight. Yeah, that's it. Oh, uh, Craig. Uh, well, I'm trying to write it now, and it's uh a story that has to deal with uh, sort of rejiggering the bad parts of fundamentalism into something not so harmful. Mm -hmm. And I'm still trying to figure out how to do it, but I think that's my next big project is to somehow save, you know, save religion. <laughs> 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 what about you? Large portion you've taken. Um, I my the, my first really big big story that I got published was um, the erotic novella at the edge of Ellensburg, and um, I spent many many years in Ellensburg, going to school, getting my degree there, and then going back again and again. Um, just because I was kind of like lost at that point in my life. And I just, it was a small, in the middle of nowhere. And I always felt like there was something about the prairie and the, just the loneliness and emptiness of, of this town kind of in the middle of nowhere that, that kind of grounded me as an artist and as a person. And um, I had some very, very significant, probably some of the, no, I'd say the most significant relationship of my life, both um, friendship and um, and sexual romantic relationship. And um, I also had some absolutely horrific things happen to me there. Where and is it? What state is it in? It's in the middle of Washington State, like in the center, okay. the center of Washington State. And there's out of out of that novella there's actually a much larger story that i've always wanted to tell a novel i wanted to write um but it's not something that i think about a lot it's just like in the back of my head it's i know when the time is right i will write it and it will just you know it'll happen um uh until then though you know i, I don't mm -hmm. No, I'm not making myself work on it. I'm working on other things. Right. Here's one for uh, Livia. 
You've written stories set in the Pacific Northwest in Manhattan, but none set in New Jersey, where you've lived for over a decade. Do you have any plans to write a New Jersey-based story in the near future, or is that still a ways off? And why have you avoided New Jersey? If <laughs> <laughs> one of the re well, see, the thing is, is that I didn't write about the Pacific Northwest until I moved out of it. Um, and I didn't write really about Manhattan until I moved into New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I need, I feel like I need some distance, you know, um, for a variety of reasons, but I'm one of those people who believe that it's great to be an artist and to always be working and stuff, but you also need to give yourself space and to let things kind of, you know, blossom inside of you in various ways. And you can't do that sometimes while you're living your life. Um, and for me, it's just natural to have some distance. And um, I've been in New Jersey now, in Jersey City for about 14 years, 16 years now. Um, God damn. Um, and I'm a Jersey girl. <laughs> And I'm finally beginning to have some distance from when I first moved here. I've seen Jersey City transform from a very, very like suburban blue collar town with just like slivers of gentrification into this full blown, we're gonna be fucking Williamsburg and just like crushing people <laughs> with these massive, unbelievable rents. And um, and now I'm beginning to see things that I can use in stories. And I do have, I don't have like tons of stuff, tons of material, but I do have one very specific thing that I probably within the next four or six months, I, I will be writing a story. Someone just said that Stable Lamentum is set in New Jersey. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, like uh, uh, like Stabilimentum, um, this new story will be about real estate <laughs> because a lot of my New Jersey, my Jersey City experiences are about about real estate. Everything that's being torn down, everything that's going up, all of these massive changes. So, and I'm, I've am i always loved stories set in Manhattan about like haunted apartment buildings or like like movies like The Sentinel, you know, it's a brownstone and it's a gate to hell, you know, things like that. Um, or Rosemary's Baby, the ultimate real estate horror, you know, movie. Um, so uh, because Jersey City is all about the real estate right now, um, that's, that's kind of where my imagination lives, so yeah. Yeah, I forgot about Stabilement. I feel very bad. Simmons and Melinda, one of her favorites, Melissa Hoffelick. Yeah. Oh, Craig, mm -hmm. so what are some of your influences? Craig, first you. Well, I would say one of them would be Samuel Delaney. I love the way that he kind of broke many barriers in terms of many ways, you know, being one of the first African Americans, as well as someone who was a very distinct stylist. There were other stylists, but he sort of went, he fell hard for postmodernism <laughs> in a way that other of them, other people didn't. And then I would say Tanith Lee, because I love her kind of decadent over the top, um, I'm smoking opium style of. <laughs> 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 uh, Livy, what are some of your influences? Literary. Um, wow. Well, you know, I put a whole list of influences on the front of my Patreon page. Um, and you don't remember any of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of, uh, I'm trying to separate the writers. Um, yeah. I, I have been, because I was spent so many years in theater, I'm very highly influenced by, by um, uh, dramatic writers, um, screenwriters, um, uh, 
poet, um, uh, Christopher Fry, uh, Robert Graves, um, the, the Greek tragedies, depending on the translations. Um, and then of course, you know, when you come to New York, a lot of times kind of go into a beat phase and, uh, you know, uh, Kerouac and uh, Ginsburg, and then I covered Walt Whitman, and then Rimbaud and Verlaine and the French, you know, decadence. Um, you know, all of those really informed me as, as I, you know, when I first moved to Manhattan. Um, and then as I started actually moving from, you know, theater into writing, um, I mean, I'd, I'd been reading, I, I read everyone. And, um, you know, I, I, my tastes are very Catholic when it comes to, to fiction and nonfiction. But when I started specifically um, writing horror and, and realizing I'm a horror writer, I would say my big biggest influences are Caitlin Kiernan and and Laird Baron and Baron. Um, Laird and Caitlin are probably my biggest two uh, influences in terms of horror, contemporary horror. Oh, mm -hmm. oh and, and Jeff Vandermeer. Um, mm -hmm. His his early fiction set in Ambergris, you know, Drayden in Love, um, that that just kind of like blew my mind um, that you could write shit like that. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you could do that. You can write about mushroom people, you know. <laughs> this gives me a whole area that I can start working in. Um, so yeah, yeah I, those are my influences. Um, I have many. Um, Craig, so you're editing a, a new flash fiction zine called Baffling. Is that that's right? And can you tell us about it? Yeah, it is weird fiction. And by weird, we mean anything that is sort of exists interstitially between science fiction, fantasy, horror, new fabulism, flash fiction with a queer point of view. Mm -hmm. And the new issue, the first issue is coming out October 1st, and I'm doing it with Dave Ring, who runs a press called Neon Hemlock, mm -hmm. Hemlock. And, you know, he lives in, um, he actually lives in D.C., so it's very easy to, to sort of talk to him about these sort of things. And we've gotten some really beautiful pieces is there a word, a word limit? Uh, word, oh, how, I mean, what do you consider flash fiction? Um, well, you know, we 1,200 mm -hmm. is sort of cut off. But if it's really good, we can make it an exception. Right. Is, it open, is it an open market or? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we've and, got, you know, names and everything. Wait, so. First did you come out yet? I, it comes out in uh, October 1st. Okay. Um, someone asked if you guys have read Rick Bowes. Uh, here it is. NXK3 asks, and this is for both of you. Have you read Rick Bowes? There's a hole in the city, his 9-11 ghost story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I read that, I was like, I don't need to write a story about 9-11 because that the story about 9-11. That's it, right. Just, yeah. You, you yeah. can't, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, and heartbreaking and one of the best stories I've ever read in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I, people should get his book, Minions on the Moon or of the oh, Moon. Of the, yeah, Minions yeah. of the Moon, yeah. And it's all about addiction and doppelgangers and mm -hmm. a good cross-section of mid-century New York, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He writes about New York City in a way that's just kind of, it, it's um, it's fantasy as a genre, but it's also because New York, Manhattan is such a, in a way, such a magical kind of weird city. And he's he's really able to um, capture that in in his in his language and, and in his fiction in a way that you, Manhattan-based writers can do. Um, yeah, it's amazing. 
So I have a question for both of you, and we, we were talking a, a little bit about this, I think, before we went live. Uh, the pandemic, of course, has affected a lot of people. So how, how has um, the pandemic affected your writing and, and your creative um, creative work? You well, I was kind of, um, there was a good two weeks where I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even think about anything. And then all of a sudden I started getting all these requests for stories. So I had to kind of push myself out of that funk and, mm -hmm. and write. And I think that maybe it, a lot of the stuff that I've written is sort of despairing and it's about environments and things like that and illnesses. So I think it has sort of slowly gotten into me that, you know, I, I only just made this connection that I've written a couple of stories about ill people. And I'm like, oh, well, that's why. <laughs> yeah. Olivia? What about you, Olivia? Oh, wow. Well, you know, I was like, the, fir the first week of, of lockdown back in March, I was like, I can do this. You know, <laughs> I don't like people. I never go out anyway. You know, I got this. Shit. yeah and i didn't write for like four fucking months i just like something in me just like shut down i was so i don't want to use the, the word sad sounds like so like like a little girl like i was sad but i really was there was like a profound sorrow um just kind of permeating me and i didn't even really realize it for the longest time i just I make, you know, I'm very good at like making lists and doing Excel spreadsheets. And I spent a lot of time doing that, and, like, but not really being able to act on anything. Um, my Patreon, I spent a lot of time just like apologizing for like, you guys are paying me money and I'm just like not doing anything, <laughs> you know? And then just, but. But I have to say the Patreon did kind of help me because it made me realize, you know, I have to, I have to, you know, writing nowadays seems to be so entwined with being online and, and the business part. And sometimes it's very difficult because you just, you just don't want to do any of that. You just want to like create art in the way that's very, very and very non-business-like, non, and not beholding, beholden to anyone. And it's very rare that people can do that anymore because we're all online, we're all selling. And um, uh, yet at the same time, um, it made me realize that I really do want to write, keep writing stories. And so I have to just at some point kick myself in the ass and start doing stuff and and like Craig I started getting invites and and um and hey you know would you like to send me something for this or that and, and I was like well yeah it's business but and I'm sad but I want to tell these stories in the time that I have left on this planet <laughs> before other people destroy it <laughs> so as sad as I am, you know, maybe I need to just find a way around that and and, and start working again. And so, you know, this summer I gradually got back into, you know, into writing. It's been difficult. It's been very hard. It still is. But um, but I'm doing it you know, however I can. Probably way too long an answer, but, you know. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a good answer. Um, so Christopher Herman asks, and this is a pretty broad question, I think, uh, for both of you, where do you want to see your genres go in the future? Uh, yeah. Craig, what, what do you think? Do you have an, an answer to that? or? Um, I guess in general, I would like the genres just to be... I want people not to just think about selling and just selling stories to some extent. Um, one of the things that 
you know, I'm looking for an agent. And one of the things that I have a hard time doing is right the way that you're supposed to pitch your story. It's gone girl meets. <laughs> and, you know, and meets Dracula. Yeah. Meets Dracula. Meets, meets <laughs> and I hate that because it seems to, what it does is that it turns everything into a little pithy thing. And I don't think that fiction is that thing. Literature. Yeah. yeah. Pitches, elevator pitches. Right. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, you have to kind of throw these things. So one of the things that I'd like to see, I guess, is I also, I'm glad that weird now is having a renaissance, meaning that it's okay to color outside the lines and it doesn't have to be realistic. It doesn't have to be firmly into horror, firmly science fiction, that you can kind of color outside the lines. So I'd like to see more of that. What about you, Livia? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the only thing I really want to see in the genre in the future right now is more of me, but I can't <laughs> <see> the right <laughs> And, and I'm having a terrible time finding an agent and I'm having a terrible time with novels. I mean, just like not even going to go into that. Um, well, Livy, I have a question. Do you feel that you're a natural novel writer and do you feel, do you want to write a novel or are you feeling forced to do it? Would you want to prefer to say? No, I, I, I think I'm very much a natural novel writer, not long novels, probably better with shorter novels. Um, uh, but I think that as long as I write about sex, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sell. I'm, to, I'm not gonna sell it to big five, big five publishers. I just, I've come to realize that it's- In horror, you mean? And not doing it in a different- I, I, don't, I don't think that I can write the kind of stuff that I write in and, and, and give 80,000 words of it to someone and say, um, I'm sorry if you have hang up, but this is my novel, you know, it's just not going to fly. And, um, <laughs> I, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's taken a long time because I've worked in publishing. And so when you work in publishing, you kind of hope as a writer that you'll succeed in the area that you work in. And, you know, it's taken me a while to realize that's not going to happen for me. But that's fine. That's fine. There are there are many many other publishers, very small independent presses who do great work, and um, I can't I can't write the way I need to to get get larger contracts. Um, I wish for the genre it would be nice to see um, to see uh, a, a greater variety of of representation in more popular. In, in the bigger books, I think we're still, you know, there's there's a huge amount of, of horror that's being published, but I still feel like, and this is not the writer's fault. I think this is, again, this is the marketing and sales and finance departments, you know, putting all of their eggs into the basket of people who have the same color, color skin as me. And, um, or, you know, just not, I would just like to see the publishers themselves, the various departments that that go to, that that come together to, to get that book out there, um, educating themselves a little bit more as to who is writing horror and how good that horror is, because I think that's part of my problem, and I know that's the problem with with other people, with people of color, and is is those departments, not editor, not editorial necessarily, but marketing, finance, sales, um, just not understanding that you know what what's being written today that's popular and that's good. You don't think that's happening? Well, I mean, it seems to be happening a bit. I, well, I do I'm, think it's happening a I, bit. I mean, I see certain writers being promoted now very well. I mean, you know, I mean. Nora Jemison, Nettie, and um, uh, Stephen Graham Jones's novel, 
um, Rebecca Roanhorse. I mean, it does seem that it's opening up somewhat. Mm-hmm. Or you're talking yeah. about, yeah, I mean, it's slow, but it's happening. I mean, it's I happening, but I, I would like to see, I would like to see more of it happening. I, I would just like to see uh, a, just a kind of a wider net being cast. Mm-hmm. Um, the, also going on with what Livia is saying, it is happening, but there was that um, hashtag publishing while black. Mm-hmm. And you discovered that people like the white writers are getting million dollar contracts. And some of them then, are. Some of them are not. I mean, right. some of them are really shitty also. Right. And <laughs> <so> <laughs> are being low names, But I know people who are white who are getting paid really crappily too and writing. Right. Right. The mid list you get fucked over. Once you, once you're described as mid list, you're sunk as far as getting decent advances. Yeah. But you know, you see things like that. Like I was dropped the who is it, Jasmine Ward or something, won mm-hmm. like several do- and she was like, Oh, I can only get this. And then some dude yeah. got a million dollars and he was yeah. unproven. That things like that. Well, that's really aggravating. Yeah. Well, oh, sorry. Go on. No, I was just going to say that um, that there there are Im- imprints like Orbit and and I mean Tor itself and um, Harper Voyager and you know each you know Saga that they they're kind of outside of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you mean the main know, publishers. I mean you mean yeah. the main publishers. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that they're the the people that I wish because a lot of one of the things is that a lot of a lot of these genre imprints often share marketing and publicity and and finance and sales mm-hmm. personnel as they do with with literary and the the people in those departments they understand literary and nonfiction but they may not understand genre mm-hmm. and so right. they're sometimes looking at things and saying you can't buy this because I don't know who to to sell this to because I don't understand this genre right I don't understand this, this sub matter so so that's what I'm saying is you know because there are so many shared departments and if if a if a if a science fiction or fantasy imprint is sharing you know their sales and marketing team with literary chances are pretty good that that sales marketing team will know a little bit more about the literary than they will about the genre. So, so that's what I'm trying to say. I feel like <laughs> you should write a blog post or a Facebook post. Well, I don't, yeah, but we're not on Facebook, right? But I feel like you should write something about this at length and, and describe this because this is probably something that people need to hear. If you want. No pressure or anything. <laughs> <laughs> You're putting a target on her. Yeah. Well, I, I would like. No, I, would, I didn't want to put a target on you or anything, but but I, I feel like you're you're bringing up important points. And, yeah. And, yeah. I I feel like there, you know, one of the reasons why I don't write a lot of things like that is because I'm always afraid that that I'm going to get stuff wrong, and I'm also afraid of the blowback. <laughs> <laughs> is, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. And honestly, also, I'm afraid as an author, I'm I'm going to say, you know, these things are wrong. And then people are going to be like, well, fuck you. You know, <laughs> when you have a manuscript ready, let's see if we buy it. You know, <laughs> so so I keep my mouth shut. Um, except here, I just fucked myself. Didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just edit the whole section out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, dub it over, we'll dub it over with some Rick Astley. It'll be perfect. Right. <laughs> there we have another one for um, Livia, if you want us to answer, ask you your question. Now that you've won the Edgar Award, congratulations for your short story, One of These Nights. Are you going to write less horror and move into writing more crime slash mystery slash noir stories? Of course not, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> um, y- you know, actually, I I think I would like to, but it's not going to be my focus. Mm. If if something comes up, if a if a story idea comes up, I don't see myself writing novels. Mm. Um, 
and unless unless I could do something like Laird is doing, which is like start off a series and and write it as as a thriller and then like psych everyone out and turn it into like fuck you, it's horror, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um I don't know. Um crime and mystery on thrillers kind of scare me a little bit because I feel like you have to have some kind of expertise in in guns or in killing people or in poisons or I, I just feel like I don't know things like that. I, I mean, cause I can make shit up about demons, <laughs> you know, no one's going to, no one's, it's not like I'm going to have the Vatican email me saying you got all this shit wrong, you know, but <laughs> I hope they don't email me, but um, maybe some of those go at chaotic demons are just like, you got me wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Girl, you're so wrong. <laughs> this is not like at all. <laughs> when I possess you, you're going to totally know that you got it fucked up and you're doing great. <laughs> yeah. Then you can write off that whole episode as research. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, I I think probably yes to stories, but but for the foreseeable future, no to longer works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any, well, more uh, any other questions coming in? Um, do you guys have any questions for each other? Well, for us. <laughs> or for us. <laughs> um, put uh, you on the spot now. Well, thanks for putting us on the spot. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I, I don't have any questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I do. So, Matt, what are you working on? Oh, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm writing a story, actually. Um, it's a science fiction story. It's for Ellen. <gasps> she asked me to write. So, yeah, th- I've been working on it for a few days or a few weeks. We're still, at, we're like in March number seven now. Yes, so yes. It's yeah, like I, I, no, I, yeah, <laughs> March, March yeah. 127. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. Ellen, what do you have coming up? I've got, uh, well, if if Best Horror number 12 was supposed to be out uh, 1st September something, and then it was moved to October 6th, and now it's moved to October 20th. Printing problems, you know, printing press. Yeah. They're busy printing Michael, what's his name? Michael Cohen's book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't print my book. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's hopefully coming out in a few weeks. Um, I'm work. I finished um, a Body Shocks reprint anthology for Tachyon that'll come out next year. I finally got help with my intro. I mean, usually I have um, someone usually helps me with my intros, and um, he kind of doesn't have time, so I had to find someone else because I just usually what I do for my intros, I take my proposal and like twisted into an intro but i didn't have a proposal i just kind of said hey can i do this you know and that means i had to start from scratch and and also kind of define what what i think body horror is it's like oh god <laughs> but anyway so anyway that's I, it's done i got it out it's coming out next year um i've been working more you know i've actually been looking for some more science fiction for tour.com i have bought several i've acquired several novellas for tour.com and uh uh one for Night Fire, uh, Cassandra Coyes will be coming out, I think, in March. Uh, nothing but black and teeth. I have a couple that I don't think I should talk about because we haven't announced them officially yet from tour.com. I mean, they're bought, you know, they're acquired, but usually they do a PR release. So I probably shouldn't mention those, but I've got ones, um, what are they? Dark Fantasy, a plague one that's not this kind of plague. Not the plague we have, and it was written before. The- <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, right. And uh, I'm working on a couple of new original anthologies that are. I'm worried that no one's going to be writing. That I'm trying to get the stories in, you know, and everyone's like been blocked for like months. So you know, <laughs> you know? so uh, we'll see what happens. You know, so that's what I'm working on. Um, kind of stressed out right now for various reasons. <laughs> Yeah. Only one big one that I'm not talking about here. Yeah. <laughs> What's Jack been working on? 
Well, your actual, your actual cat. Right now. He's working on destroying the apartment <laughs> <laughs> and biting me. Other than that, he's been very restful. You know, okay. and getting bigger and bigger. I mean, he'll eat like a pit. He eats everything in sight. You know, I mean, I'm sure he's going to have something in common. <laughs> I mean, I, I, they both do for a checkup at the vet, but it's like, well, they're not sick, so I'm not going to take them in, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. But he must, he's like gigantic. And, <laughs> and he would like to get bigger because he wants to eat more, you know? Sophie won't eat. I have to, you know, I have to like picky, picky Sophie. It's like, please eat some. If I got her stuff, cheap stuff with lots of liquid, she'll lick, she'll eat the liquid and leave the chunks for him. I know. <laughs> so, you know Jack's, Jack's sorry, the thought of cat food just makes me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my God, that's scared of most of all is cat food. Yeah, cat food. Yes. Your yeah. next story needs to be cat food horror. Yeah. 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 I, I hate it. From, from the camera. Oh I hate the commercials. It's the commercials where you think it's like some amazing food and then it's like dog or cat food. You're just like, oh, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They put it in a crystal tablet. No food will not cat food. Yeah. 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 No matter what flavor it is, she will not go near it. It's like poison. Yeah. And it's like, what's wrong with it? It's like, what is your problem? You know. But anyway, um, we're all we're all working here together, me and the cats. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, kibble punk, yeah. Kibble punk, yeah. Kibble punk. <laughs> That's perfect. Perfect. They, eat, they would eat kibble all the time, but I Jack can't yeah. eat only kibble because he's male and it's bad for him. Sophie would kibble all the time. I can't leave it out because he'll eat it. I can only say, here, eat a few. She'll eat a few and then stop, walk away, and then he'll eat it. So I have to put it away in the fridge because he'll knock things over. I mean, he also knocks things over to get to annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> he has knocked, not knocked over anything breakable. He knocks over things that don't break so far. And he actually is, considering his size, he's extremely nimble. I mean, he jumps on top of my refrigerator, which has tons of stuff on it. But then, of course, he doesn't know how to get down because there's tons of stuff on it. But jumping up, he's fine. He just jumped up. Matt, you know the um, the CD case I have next to my computer yeah. with all that stuff on top of it? He jumped. He actually climbed on there last night for the first time. And I knew he wouldn't be able to get off. He didn't knock anything over. But I knew that it was the way you could get off without that. Because you have a lot of things on that CD. Yes, show. I do little things yeah. that will go between my computer yeah. and, and my cocktail table and my little CD. There's this with space with wires. Anyway, so I grabbed him. I had to pick him up and deposit him on, on, on the floor. And of course, I knocked something over picking him up. But he would have knocked everything over getting off. He's just impossible. You know, <laughs> problem. It's Jack the Jerk. Yeah. yeah. He's mulling over life right now. He's lying next to me in the, in yeah. the park. <laughs> He's so. enjoying the attention. <laughs> Horror story about a serial killer who turns people into cat food and then the cats won't eat it. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like that. I like Jack yeah. and the book plants new book. Yeah, Jack was Jack was behind me. He doesn't want he doesn't want to eat the plants. He wants to rub himself against them. Of course. You know? And then, of course, so he knocks the planter over. And then he, like, was lying on the planter. I was like, what? You know, he, luckily he's, I, you know, with a new cat, new cats, you have to be careful you don't get plants that they'll eat because a lot of them are poison. Yeah. And, but, yes, so that's my life. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not in a pandemic. I mean, I go out. I've been eating out with friends. I go out almost every day and go to the supermarket. Or whatever, masked, of course. Uh, so, my life, you know, I do miss, you know, theater and movies and seeing more than one friend at a time and going out to. I don't know when I'll ever go back to an indoor meal. <laughs> you know, certainly not to the vaccine, but I love eating outside with friends. That's really nice. Yeah. So, um, so we have no more questions coming in. Any final thoughts from you guys anything that you wanted to say and didn't uh 
Check Kurt. out Olivia's work. Let me do this. So here, uh, you can get Fergus at the link below. Uh, definitely check out Livia and her Patreon. Do you have a Patreon, Craig? I, I wasn't no, sure. No, no. Okay. Um, you can get Spectral Hue uh, here. Uh, there's the Amazon link, or just Google it, and you get it at your favorite bookstore. Um, so, yeah, unless there's anything else you guys want to say, um, this has been great. Uh, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Livia. Uh, thank, thank you. you all for, and for, uh, video for joining us. Who joined us tonight. Thank you, yeah. thank you everybody, who, who tuned Thanks, in everyone. Uh, live and also, you know, who, who watched, who will watch this after the fact. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I know there. my mom who will be watching this and be like really upset that I didn't tell her that it was live and <laughs> <laughs> you can, but you I can miss when people I know are watching like my you can mom. tell her like it's oh it's live tomorrow morning you be like it's live mom no I, that was me right there yeah yeah <laughs> mom if you're watching this now tomorrow is live right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got a, there's a panel that I did for Final Cut um, for Story Fest 2020 that was in Westport last year. We did, I did a panel with um, Stephen Graham Jones, Christopher Golden, um, I think Josh Mallerman and Nathan Ballenberg and Siobhan Carroll, I believe those are the people who, oh no, ACY, sorry. I think that was all of it. And anyway, it's going to be, I mean, we recorded it a couple of weeks ago. It's going to be on, uh, I think, September 24th or 26th. You can look it up. But it's called um, Story Fest 2020. And it was fun. It was a fun um, panel we did about movies, about movies and horror. So people might want to check that out. All right. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're going to end that there. Um Guys, stay on. Don't um, hang up. I'm just going to end the live broadcast. But thank, thank you again to everybody who tuned in. And we'll see you next month with Thanks, Larry and Joe Hill. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.